Hi, please state your name and your pronouns. My name is Roger Johnson and my pronouns are he, him, his. All right, and my name is Gabrielle Samuels and my pronouns are she, her, hers. So Roger, when, were you, when and where were you born? Tell me a little bit about your hometown and how you grew up. All right, so I am originally from the beautiful state of South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina to be exact. However, when I was two years old, me and my mom relocated to Durham, North Carolina. And so that's where I received um, all of my education up till college. So um, just a little bit about Durham, I would say from both places, from both South Carolina and Durham, I was just kind of raised up in this enclave of blackness, just a really two strong communities um, for African-Americans, one being in South Carolina, because, you know, that kind of been a, being a place where uh, slavery was so predominant at and being in a, in a place where slavery was so known at, however, still being surrounded by the Gullah Geechee culture which is um, one of the, you know, I guess, closest things to African or closest, closest, closest cultures, there we go, to Africa that we have um, here in America. And so just being, um, having family and that and seeing that kind of being brought up. And then what is it being in Durham, which is actually the home of the Black Wall Street. So going to um, a high school that had that history in the background and having local HBCUs like North Carolina Central University, um, right down the street, and just having a lot of other professors and teachers growing up that went to HBCUs. I had a lot of teachers that went to HBCUs like Howard, like Morehouse, like Norfolk State, like a TSU. And so that really kind of groomed me into the person that I am today in my ideals um, of what Blackness is. And, and all, also in a good way, it showed me it gave me role models growing up to see like people that I can look at and just look up to and see that they actually look like me. Okay. Do you think that your passion for activism started kind of early? I definitely do um, think that it started early. Um, my family, very Christian based. Uh, my grandfather, he is a bishop. So I grew up in the church in like kind of, and activism role or advocacy role where it wasn't just about going to church it was about going into into the community it was about having those book back drives and those back to school drives and about um sticking up for people who um were less fortunate than us it was about going to um i know there was a lot of times where we went to the courthouse and we would stand with people as they were doing their trials and we would go to the hospital and we would help pray over people and so all of that um, kind of tied into my advocacy and my fight for others. And then in terms of activism, I started being an activist when I believe, uh, I believe that was sophomore year or junior year in high school. I actually uh, put on a water drive for Flint, Michigan, and we uh, actually raised or we actually gathered about 200 cases of water as well as um, later that year, I was protesting against police brutality with the students from North Carolina Central University. We um, actually blocked one of the major highways in Durham. And so that was kind of like my own individual start to um, activism. And then from college, it just took off. Do you think that that also influenced your major and how you chose it? Um, it influenced it, I would say, uh, not at the time when I first started my major. When I first came to UNCG, I was a international business major because I wanted to travel the world and all of that good stuff. However, after um, we have, in the African American Studies Department, we have the CASE Conference. And for those of you who don't know, the CASE Conference is a conference that our department or our program holds every year. And it just goes over different topics that concern African American um, population and culture. And so I was going to do that conference and I saw one of the the founders of our program, Dr. Norice Woods, and he was talking about Henry Thoreau, which is an actual famous Black artist. He was one of the first in America. And so after that, I started, um, I realized that one, this was very interesting and it showed somebody that looked like me that made history in America, but it was something that I was actually interested in learning about. So then after that, I changed my major to African American um, history. And then as I go deeper into the major, it allowed me to explain myself better and explain, I guess, look at America and its history and the things currently going on through the specific lens of the African-American identity. 
Okay. And what is your major as well as African American history? So I am a double major in African American history and political science. Okay. And do you think that UNCG helped nurture that and made it grow and like help you get into it a little bit more? So I would say that UNCG, on the side of African American studies, I believe that UNCG, they did a great job. Um, my professors, I, I'll tell my personal story. When I got to UNCG, um, I had I had basically the same kind of hair stuff, the same the same kind of haircut, like Afro cut on the sides, cool. But being a business major, um, I didn't see people that looked like me. Um, or the people who I did see that looked like me, they had close cut, very um kind of clean shaven look. And so that kind of um discouraged me for I guess my role and how I was gonna fit in and how like well I was gonna do within the program. Because a lot of us know, we know that, you know, even though you can say or you can have a lot of good stuff inside, a lot of people they judge on that what's on the outside first. And so that kind of um really took a toll on me and how far I can like or how well I could perform as a business student and as a college student. However, as soon as I changed to the major of African American studies, there were so many different people in the department that looked like me. The people who they were bringing in from outside of the department looked like me. Um, there were so many just people just encouraging for me just to be myself and my, my, not only my perspective, but just the way that I look. And so I'll say from a, I guess, a cultural perspective, the African American Studies Department, they definitely um, nourished me and UNCG from that perspective nourished me too. As, um, and I think from an intellectual standpoint as well, UNCG nurtured me as well because they allowed me, they saw my degree and they allowed me to come in on different panels and say from my experience. Um, definitely, I believe that as an African-American, we all have experiences and we all have um, personal experiences that we can um, eloquate or we can just talk about in, in different groups. However, I feel as though having that experience and education allowed me to stand out in different panels and in different forums. And so I definitely think that UNCG nurtured that for me. Okay. As far as the marchers, have you ever done anything prior to this, like before that um, kind of went along with marching or anything like that? So as, as I said before, I did, the, um, I've marched, of course, 2020, I marched. I marched basically all year 2020. And um, I started, I did my first march in 2016. And I'll go back and that's another thing that I'll say UNCG nurtured uh, for me, which is um, marching and protesting. For those of you who don't know, um, I've been at UNCG since 2016. I'm currently a senior in the year of 2020, graduating 2021 in May, which I am excited about. However, um, I said that because when I first came to UNCG in 2016, there were so many on campus protests. Um, there were protests when we took over the Mossman building, which is our financial aid building, and we had a sit-in. There were protests in our Elliott University Center building, which is um, the main building for campus. Um, we sat in that. There were lots of protests on the lawn and in a different um, greenery areas. And so there was just heavy presence of activism at UNCG, um, even in the CAF, under the CAF, in the CAF, outside the CAF, um, we were protesting. And so I'll say that that nurtured, one, my um, mental when it came to believing what could be done as a college student. A lot of times we don't um, hear about what we don't really how many movements were started on college campuses. And um, as I was starting my own movement, I was thinking about that and I was encouraged by that because it was like, um, it brought me back to my younger years at UNCG and it made me realize that if we could do it back then, then we still can do it now. And so bringing that to say, I did plan my own march. It was the Greens Around Love March. Um, I, first, um, I first planned it or I wanted it to be because I knew that as college students um, in March, we had to leave campus because of COVID-19. However, between March and August, we had um, a lot of brutal um, police brutality. We had the murder of George Floyd, of Breonna Taylor, um, of Maude Aubrey. And so there was just a bunch of different things that happened that I felt as though college students, we wanted to express. Um, and so, you know, even though we were probably protesting in our hometown, Greensboro was our home as well. And I know that we wanted to show our support 
and are standing for the movements that were here and the movements all over the world. And so when I got back to campus, I wanted that for just the students to have that. And so that's where the Greensboro Love March was created. I ended up, um, of course, getting the help of Miss Gabby, who is on the call uh, with me. And um, we just got together people from all over UNCG. And I think that that was an encouraging thing. Um, and then I, I guess a word of encouragement to anybody that is planning a march, there is a lot more people for you than it is against you. I was so surprised by how many people from all over campus, from the Student Government Association, to staff and faculty, to the higher ups um, like in the chancellor's office and from the financial aid building to um, different organizations that I knew, like the African American Diaspora Studies Club and uh, the Black Business Student Association and different fraternities and sororities that actually came out and supported the movement. Um, I even had um, my friend, she came out of town from Georgia just to march with us. And so that made me realize that, um, like I said before, there are more people for you than against you. And um, if you actually just step out and take the time to do it, you might see that it's actually accomplishable. Oh, wow. So who did you really want involved in the march and why? So um, as I mentioned before, I wanted as many people from across campus to be involved in the march as possible um, because I'm currently or back then I was the president of the Neo Black Society, which was which is the oldest organ black organization on the campus. And so we have been around this year for 52 years. And so even though we have been around for so long, I didn't just want it to be our organization. I wanted it to be um, anybody that was willing to and would just come out and join with us. And so I reached out to um, Gabrielle, I reached out to um, different organizations just to come out because I wanted this to be a united effort. It wasn't just about um, being, it wasn't just a black problem or a white problem. It was an everybody problem. It was something that um, as black people, as you, if you see us hurting, then that should be something that you uh, stand against. And so I wanted to show um, the allyship that we have here on just the campus of UNCG. And so I, like I said before, I reached out to um, a couple of different people, including student organizations, uh, but I also reached out to the IOC, which is the Office of Intercultural Leadership and, um, which is the Office of Intercultural Leadership Council, but it's housed by the OIE, which is the Office of Intercultural Engagement. There we go, that was a lot of acronyms. But um, they are the kind of the multicultural center of UNCG. And so shout out to, um, I believe his name is Augusto, Augusto, but we call him Gus. He made sure that not only our organization or black organizations were a part of the movement, but he reached out to different organizations just to pull us, um, pull us all together as a campus. And so, um, like I said before, it was, I wanted to reach out to anybody that was um, an ally and who was willing to march for the cause. Okay. Was there ever a time where you didn't know if it was going to work out or did the pandemic pose a challenge? Oh, yes. There was definitely, um, I would say there was a few um, kind of factors that played in and a few different reasons that I was scared that it wasn't going to happen. First of all, um, I think it just being COVID-19, when we came back to campus, there was a lot of talk about, you know, UCG sending its students back home. There was a lot of talk because Duke, Carolina, and I believe Elon, they had already sent their students back home. So personally, I didn't want to be the cause of students going um, back home and being kicked off campus because I know how many students had kind of, um, I would say how many students were disappointed and had to move in March kind of in one weekend. So I didn't want that to be happen again because of something that I did. And then also another thing that kind of through, uh, I guess, a hardship at me or a challenge toward me. For those of you who don't know a couple of, or just a, a quick background knowledge about UCG, um, before my class and before my, I guess, generation of UCG students, there was an incident that happened on our campus um, where a fight broke out and it was on the news. And so since then, I feel as though UCG has been very precautious of the things that we allow to happen on campus. With that being said, um, I didn't want, I was, I didn't want something like that. I knew something like that was not going to happen again. However, I wanted to make sure that the people who are in charge, like the um, campus activities and programming, would trust me enough to where they knew that I was doing something safe, safe and peaceful. 
Okay. Um, how did you decide on the setting of the march and like the path that it was going to take? Right. So um, when I first started the march, it was going to be a collaborative march between North Carolina a and and UNCG. However, unfortunately, North Carolina a and which is North Carolina Agricultural and Technology State University. Might I, might I add the illustrious North Carolina a and at that? So um, it was supposed to be a collaborative effort. However, North Carolina um, a and they were having, they were very strict with the COVID-19 and the kind of precautionary measures that they were taking. And so it became just a march for UNCG students. And then from there, I went for the direction of going down Spring Garden Street because I wanted to march to the courthouse. Um, it was Labor Day, so I knew that there was going to be a lot of people in downtown Greensboro. And so I wanted to make as much, um, not only as much noise as possible, but I wanted to take as much of a stand as possible to um, make people aware of what was going on and make people aware of how it was affecting college students. Okay. Um, is there a reason you picked like this destination, the courthouse? I picked the courthouse because it was just a, the courthouse was a scene that was used for so many prior protests um, that year. Um, throughout, I stayed here in Greensboro and throughout all of, um, from I would probably say May till August until currently, there were lots of protests that were going on that started at the courthouse and left and as they walked around downtown or that went from another destination and met at the courthouse and so there was really just um it's just really an iconic space and for people to gather and so i knew that uncg we needed that iconic space to make our statement to make our impression on the city Okay, and when you got to the courthouse, did y'all just turn around or what happened at the courthouse? So um, when we got to the courthouse, it was so amazing because we had performers, we had uh, people who did spoken word, we had a prayer, we had um, a woman by the name of Christian Anderson, who is a, a powerhouse singer from the community. She came out and sang. And so it was just a moment of solidarity um, it was a moment of just expression. I think one of the best things about protests is um, the expression that comes out of it. If you are, I was, and I encourage that, if you are a, I guess, an artist or anybody with some form of talent, this is the perfect time for you to express. We need um, all writers and we need people who are taking historical notes so that we can, um, what we can't say in words, we can say in pictures or in songs. And so um, that's what we were doing in that day is we were expressing our feelings in songs and in words. And so everybody from who were there and everybody who watched online just resonated what, with what was said, which was, um, you know, just that Black Lives Matter and that, you know, police brutality has to end. And also there was, like I said before, there was the theme of Greensboro love. And um, I failed to mention, but a kind of segue into that or another side of that was, as college students in the COVID-19 pandemic, we were just so, I guess, disconnected and separated. And so it's very hard for, as an African-American college student, I knew that it was very hard for, one, for you to be going through a pandemic, but on top of that, have to see social injustice and police brutality, and then be separated from a place like college where we can discuss that in open forums. And so I wanted college students who were coming back to know that, one, um, that we're going to discuss this and then we're going to discuss this in a manner where you can express yourself and you're surrounded by people who love you. And so I think all of that when we had the Greensboro Love March and we were, um, people were displaying their talent, all of that was kind of displayed. It was not only um, the stand of solidarity, but it was this stand of unity amongst our own community and amongst our own um, Black UNCG faculty, staff, and students. All right. As I come to understand it, y'all all walked there together and then you decided to walk back. Why did you decide to walk back together as well? So we decided to walk back and walk there together because one, we were we marched through, of course, the OCG community as well as some neighboring neighborhoods. And so, of course, walking there and walking back meant that we were like chanting. And so we had lots of great chants, lots of um different people from 
you know, different UNCG people who weren't even in, I guess, the leadership or the planning of the march, who were volunteering their voices to be heard and be um, just announced throughout neighborhoods. And also, um, it's just about staying together. Uh, we go there together, we come back together. Um, it's just this idea of unity and making sure um, I, it's, it's, even though I, I believe that protesting will always be protesting, Thing. But I feel as though walking there together, it just reminded me of, you know, growing up in school and, and being in college classes and looking at the different civil rights movements and looking at them singing Negro spirituals and looking at them just um, kind of stand against uh, physically, emotionally and mentally against, um, you know, racial inequality. And so that's what I wanted to kind of replicate. I wanted us to just stand physically, emotionally and mentally going there and back against all of these things that were um, kind of stacked up against us. Okay. How would you describe the atmosphere during the time of that you're planning the march and during the march? So the atmosphere was very, I would say, um, encouraging and revitalizing. I think I planned the march, of course, as I said before, I, I was planning the march all summer long. And so alongside with me planning and calling different people, I was going to marches myself. So, and so it was like every time I would plan, I would go home and plan the march, it was like I would get discouraged because of things like COVID and because me not knowing of whether it could happen or not. But then I would go to a march and just be encouraged and revitalized by all these different faces and all these different people who were um, doing the same thing that I was trying to do. And so that was um, definitely the, I guess, the energy or the environment that I was surrounded by. And then when I got to UNCG, I received so much um, positive affirmation and confirmation from faculty and staff just telling me to like continue and, and go on. And like whether, um, you know, some people say no or not, still do it, but do it in your own way. And so I would say playing the march, um, and playing the march was a very positive um, experience. However, um, of course, planning it was, it was positive. However, the reason that I had to do it was negative. Um, there was a, there's another side, you know, there's two sides to every coin, like it just as it was positive, it was negative as well, because, you know, we had to look on the TV and see, um, you know, the repetitive story of George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery and just these different stories, um, you know, not only stories from 2020, but um, prior stories like Sandra Bland and um, Trayvon Martin and um, Emmett Till being uh, rehashed and re-brought up because this is something that had happened or has been happening since the beginning of America, um, this kind of this brutality against African-Americans and against just black people in general. And so there was just, um, like I said before, there was these two sides. It was a really positive side where I was reminded of what this could be. And then it was a negative side where I was reminded what it had been. Okay. And what were some not notable moment moments during for you? Um, some notable moments for me uh, were after the march, we posted the pictures, beautiful pictures um, of the march and the people, the talent that sung and did a spoken word and of the protest signs and just seeing the response that we got from like social media and how many people, um, you know, because UNCG, the Ardenio Black Society, that's how we got started. Our organization was founded from the protests on UNCG's campus. We were founded because there were so many um, racist and prejudiced um, professors that it was kind of, we couldn't do anything as black people on campus. We couldn't run for student body president or um, student government association. We couldn't run for homecoming offices. We couldn't um, just make ourselves too well known without, um, I guess, racist or prejudiced people coming against us. And so we did have to protest that. And so it reminded a lot of our alumni of our beginning. And so a lot of our alumni, they gave such positive reviews because they were saying that this is the MBS, the MBS that they founded and that this is the MBS that they were reminded of. And then it gave, um, as current students who are not on campus, it just gave them this kind of reminder that you know there is a safe place when you get back to UNCG where people are still protesting, people are still speaking out, people are still, um, you know, just standing against racism and police brutality. And also we did this, we had the march in September. And so 
it gave a lot of people energy and it refueled, it refueled a lot of people because, you know, around September, the movement was kind of dying down. People were um, getting back to work from COVID-19. But I honestly think it were, the march reminded people like, hey, we're still out there. Keep on going hard. Keep marching in the streets. Even if you have to go in on Saturdays, take your Saturdays and do what you got to do. Um, don't let, I guess, people who are in power, don't let them forget that we had marked for this. Don't um, keep up with the story of Breonna Taylor. Keep up with the story of George Floyd. Keep up with the story of Sandra Bland. This is, we're not just doing this for the moment, but we're doing this for a lifetime so that um, things can be changed forever. And so that's what um, my positive experience was from the March or that was something that kind of made it impersonal for me. Okay. Um, what kind of outcome did you expect from this March? So I would say the outcome that I expected from the March, um, it was, I'll say this, we, I was working with the UNCG Police Department, the UNCG um, Campus Activities Programming, Greensboro County Police Department. And so the fact that we were literally working almost to the day of, I probably say to the Friday, uh, Thursday and Friday of, to actually get the March approved. And so the fact that it actually just got off the ground and we could do it, that was like enough for me. However, um, what I was expecting out of the March um, was just people to show up and for us to have a voice. Um, that was pretty much it. One of, the, I think, the best things that I learned from the March is that just like money, power, and um, I would say your voice amplifies who you are on the inside. And so there were a lot of times where I did have to refocus my mind because it was like, you know, I was so um, focused or so like minded toward the attendance and who's going to be there and what is the news going to say and like whatever like upper like levels are going to say. But then I had to remind myself that I'm not doing that for any um, news outlet. I'm not doing that for anybody um, who is not concerned or is not an ally. I'm not doing it for the higher ups. But I'm, what I'm doing is for myself because I know how um, important Black lives are. But two, I'm going, I'm doing it for the students who might want to do this, but might be afraid to. And so um, that when I was actually able to do it, I feel as though my goals were accomplished. I did it for myself. I did it for um, the people who might have been afraid to do it. And I did it for the people who could not do it. Because I think a lot of times we forget in the movement that there are a lot of people who might want to march, who might want to go out and speak, but because of different things, such as jobs, such as family, um, such as physical health, they might not be able to do it. And so um, when I was able to march and I was able to speak my opinion and um, vocalize with the things that I thought was important, it was that was basically all that I had came there to do. It was just a moment of me um, being real with the world and with our community and just vocalizing my own thoughts and expressing my own opinion and experiences. Okay. And how was the overall response to the march from the students and from bystanders and everything? So I would say, like I said before, lots of students came out. One of the things that I thought was interesting from bystanders, we had so many people that were stopping in their car that were, um, you know, throwing up the black power fist that were, you know, beeping their horns in solidarity that were um, just, like I said before, there were people that, like my friends came from Georgia. There was a couple of people that came from off the side of the streets who actually just started walking with us. Don't know where these people came from or they had heard about the march. Uh, they just started walking with us. And so all of those things just kind of added on to the, I would say, the, um, what is it called? The, what is it? What is, what is your question? The response or the ambiance? Their, their response. Um, <laughs> all things added up just to the response of the march. And also in my own personal life, I was able to actually, I would say a couple of weeks ago, I was able to speak on the UNC uh, system, the panel for diversity and racial in, in, inequality. There we go, or equality. Hopefully I'm saying that right. However, um, it just added to um, my presence on there from being just a UNCG source of knowledge to like this UNC system um, main and being able to 
encourage students from ECU, from the UNC Asheville, from UNC Wilmington, and express to not only them, but the people, the board members of the UNC system school, that this is something that is going on in the black community on college campuses. And um, protest is, protesting is something that can be done um, in all UNC system schools. And so I think if anything, the march, the outcome of my march um, made my voice even louder and made my um, rep representation known more in the community. Okay. Um, did this change your opinion on anything involving organizing or protesting? Uh, I would say it, it didn't for the simple fact that um, being a president of an organization, being in the political science department, being in the African American studies department, there are so many um, places where I had to get people together, whether it was planning events, whether it was like registrations, whether it was conferences, so many people where I had to um, just get people together and organize things. Um, and so that kind of idea of what that looked like stayed the same. However, I will say what changed for me was my, for lack of better words, how much I cared about who ha what people had to say. And I know that's pretty much, that's like not acceptable in some circles or that's a bad, bad I guess, analogy or I guess, I guess comparison. However, um, I realized that a lot of times it's not that people are actually saying no, it's the thought of them saying no that stops us from doing things. And so during that time, I was scared because I thought people would say no. I thought that people would tell me not to do it. I thought that I would have to um, go against this kind of like huge system. And the thought of that went, um, and I just think that the thought of that kind of just scared me a little bit because I knew that it was not only myself, it was the people, it was students that I was leading. And so, you know, in protest, sad to say, sometimes we don't know what will happen. A lot of protests, they start out peacefully, but however, because of um, aggression from, you know, counter protesters, they can end up very violent. And so I didn't know what I was gonna be met with um, both behind the scenes and in front of the scenes. Cause like I said, I was planning to think, or I didn't get um, kind of confirmation that I could do it until kind of the Thursday or Friday before the march. However, um, with that being said, all in all, as I ended the march, I think all of my fear from what other people would say kind of like disappeared. And moving forward, I know that I stand in my own truth and I find strength in my own truth. And so it's like, you know, whether people will say that they want you to do it or not, whether people are saying that this is a good idea or not, whether people are um, saying that, you know, you might not even have the grounds to march or we might stop you from marching. I can't allow that to stop what I'm doing. You know, you have to realize that you are a force to be reckoned with just like everybody else. You know, so you have to see the power in your own self as well as the power in your adversary. Okay. After you graduate and somewhat move past UNCG, do you think that this protest and all the other protests that have gone on during the summer will be remembered as impactful? I believe that it will be remembered as impactful if we keep up the conversation. I think that, um, like I said before, those I have videos, I have pictures of the first marches that we did from UNCG in 2016. I even have, still have my sign that I made from 2016. And so I believe all of, all of those things are, um, personally for me, are things that I'm gonna tell uh, um, future UNCG students as well as my own children about the things that I was able to do in college. And so I definitely think that um, those stories and those narratives can live on if, like I said before, if we make sure that we tell um, future UNCG about those and if we actually keep on having them. I think that, you know, it protests are something, are not just an event. Like they're not just a, I guess, a reaction from an event, but they're a reaction from a lifestyle. And so you're, if your lifestyle is activism, if your lifestyle is advocacy, if your lifestyle is speaking out for those who cannot speak out for, 
for themselves, then your um, lifestyle should also represent, there we go, represent protesting because it means that you're standing up against something. And so if we um, kind of duplicate the lifestyle at UNCG, then I do believe that protesting will continue, that um, our children and the future people at UNCG will know that they at UNCG that they have a safe space and that is something that they can do. I think for me personally, that's something that I just want future UNCG students to know that this is something that you can do. Don't let any um person, place or thing stop you from having the idea that protesting, that speaking out for something that you think is right is something that you can't do as a student. Um, I was having a, a talk with the UNC um, system panel, and that was one of the things that we were bringing up was that people have to remember that today's students are tomorrow's alumni. And so as, um, as students, you have to create experiences that make you proud as an alumni. You know, you have to create experiences that make that you can tell your own children and your own future, um, you know, colleagues about. And so that's why I think that, you know, this experiences and these marches will live on. Because I think that there are people who were there and people who participated in that who will tell their um, future family members and their future UNCG students about what they can do and inspire them to do more. Okay. Is there anything else you would like to say? Um, one last thing or a couple of last words that I would like to say is that, you know, wherever you, whether you are watching this and you go to UNCG, you're in school, you're not in school, um, whatever the case may be, I would say to um, use your voice and express your opinion and live in your truth. Like I said before, you have to realize that you are a power to be reckoned with as well. Um, especially as as a student on a college campus, I um, as I was going to classes, some of it seemed as though there were some classes that valued education over personal experience. However, what I say to that is, I've been living as a black man for 22 years, and there are some things that education is going to show you that I that I've seen. You know what I'm saying? Like there are some things that education hasn't seen that I've seen. And so that's why it's important for you to always go places, for you to always say your opinion, for all, for you to always stand in your truth. Because there are some fights that unfortunately have to be fought outside of the classroom. There are some fights that have to be fought outside of office buildings. And so it is up to you to fight those fights. You know what I'm saying? You have to be willing and you have to be put yourself out there so that you can um, stand up because it's not only about expressing your opinion, but it's also about giving strength to those who don't think that their opinion should be expressed. You know, with every um, person that stands up, it's a multitude of people who have to fall down. And so I think that, like I said before, make sure that you are expressing your opinion. And then if anything, um, and I think that this is the most important thing, is that there are more people for you than against you. And I mean, and it was, and I, I would say that in this experience, I've figured that out so many times where it was just like, there were so many people, it was like for, for one person, for every one person that was against me, there were at least 10 people that were for me. I mean, there were people, um, people who I would just stand on the street and I would just like spark them a conversation with from church, from family to friends that I told about the um, march that they were like so encouraging that they were just so um inspiring and telling me that I can do this. Um, people who made me believe that I had more power at that time than I was willing to believe myself. And so I just say that word of encouragement to everybody out there to just know that there are more people for you than against you. And that, um, like I said before, if, if you need back of that, know that I believe in you, um, know that people before you have done this and that they believe you, believe in you. So don't think that you're um, by yourself and then also, if you just turn on the news and you look at all the protests from, from around the world, there are so many people who are um, participating in the Black Lives Matter protests. And that's one thing that I love about it is that it is not, um, we have this kind of horizontal leadership structure where it's not like, it's not a hierarchy to this thing. You don't have to be a president of something. You don't have to be um, a chancellor of something. 
You don't have to be um, somebody at the top of a business. It's everyday people who are coming together and having protests, who are coming together and speaking out. So I would say be, be one of those everyday people. Be one of those people who just decide that enough is enough today and that you're going to start um, that you're going to start a movement. And I promise you, like, you know, you might start off by yourself. But before you know it, you'll have two people. And then before you know that, you'll have four people. And then you'll have eight people and so on and so on. And the movement will grow because I, I can honestly say that that's how my movement started. It started off by myself. And before I know it, I had people like Gabrielle. And then I had more people from SGA and more people from the Black Student Association. And just all these people from my own, my one person's thinking turned into um, a whole protest and a whole movement. And so I encourage you to know that you can do it, your voice matters, that this is something that can be accomplished. All right, thank you so much for your time. Welcome.